I'm meeting an expert in autistic hypersensitivity, Dr. Luke Bearden. He's chosen to meet me here at the Moore Market. It's an indoor market, I can see that, and um, it looks pretty busy. Not necessarily in terms of people, but in terms of sensory stimuli of all kinds. I can already smell it from outside. <laughs> oh, well, here goes. Oh, God. Nearly all autistic people report being unusually responsive to at least one of the senses. Bright lights, temperature, unexpected noises, texture and taste can all be challenging. You must be Luke. Hi Chris, Hello. welcome. Uh, I feel like I should apologise in advance for dragging you, you here. Apologize. I feel like you're taking one for the team. Um... <laughs> Luke is a senior lecturer and autism researcher at Sheffield Hallam University. He's dedicated his career to speaking to autistic people about their experiences. Why is my sensory experience here so radically different from a non-autistic person? What's happening is your primary senses, whether they're good or bad or indifferent, are picking up all of that external stimuli, and what happens then is what I call the filtering process. The brain takes that sensory information, filters it, and then what the non-autistic person ends up with is a conscious understanding of the sensory environment. OK, so are you saying that for non-autistic people they are able to block this, some of this out? a huge amount of it out. They're actually not aware of certain sounds or smells or sights and so on, whereas the autistic person is aware of all of it. But how does that work mechanically? How is that wiring different in my brain? There's no definitive answer, which makes the whole sensory side of things A, fascinating, and B, extraordinarily complex. Should we go for a little walk? Absolutely. To continue to stimulate our senses. Being unable to filter out this onslaught of information can have significant consequences for autistic people. Someone hypersensitive to smell might vomit at the faintest whiff of perfume. Someone hypersensitive to sound might find it challenging to leave home. That maybe somewhat dark side of the sensory world needs to be embraced and understood and accepted as well. I know individuals, for example, who have not eaten at school because the smell of the cafeteria is enough that they cannot digest food. I know young adults who have ended up in anorexia wards, not because they're anorexic, but because they have sensory aversions to certain types of food. And that behavior has been misunderstood in these examples as anorexia, as opposed to understanding the person from an autistic perspective. OK, let's um, leave the fish. After the stress of the market, I want to take Luke somewhere I feel more comfortable to explore one of the contradictions of autism. Why I, like so many, seek out specific sensations. When I go into the supermarket, ideally, I'd like to be able to block stuff out. And I do block it out by simply not going. When I come here, I want everything to come in. The sound of the trees in the wind, the sound of the trees in the rain. And to know them differently, for me, is brings uh, I was going to say it brings me joy. It, it, it's not actually, it's not, it's comfort it brings me. I think what you're describing is a conscious effort of sensory seeking. If you've identified something that soothes you, gives you joy, gives you comfort, that you're then going to be hyper aware of that. There's absolutely categorically no denying that some autistic people's sensory experiences are the best Thing to them about being autistic. I've heard people saying, I feel so sorry for people who don't experience the sensory joy that I experience by sniffing the dog or listening to the noise of geese on brand new snow. So there's this extraordinary juxtaposition on the one hand of sensory joy and on the other hand, sensory distress, sometimes within the same individual. 